Hello? The PhD for is still pursuing as she has delivered talk chair discussion in Las Vegas, United States, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, Indonesia, UK, Nepal, Dubai, Rome, Paris. Uh, she is an expert guys, in the field of entomology, insect uh, diversity, plant-based specialization, insecticides. She is a member of many editorial boards of more than 25 journals. I welcome Dr. Mira Sivastha. For chair the session, and I welcome Dr. Sucheta. Sucheta is not audible. Yes, sir, I am here. Okay, Sucheta. Uh, yes. Yeah, you did. You did change the session. Hello, Dr. Yes. Dr. Yes, yes. Dr. Madhusudan Gowan, the chair of the session. Dr. Yes, sir. She is also professor of zoology. She is a uh, biologist. She has also produced half dozen of PhD students. So without taking so much time, already we are running for the time. I would give the mic to Honorable Chairperson Dr. Mira Sivastav and Dr. Suchata. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Yes, thank you, sir. Very good afternoon. I'm Dr. Suchata here from Mango. I'm happy to uh, tell that our organized secretary did a great job with a limited time. Um, uh, very, very happy and congratulating whole team for the success. And we are very proud the part of the event. Uh, today, uh, my role is uh, chairing the session. Our eminent scientist, Dr. Arun Chaugreser, uh, is going to present application of ionizing radiation in healthcare uh, from today till uh, from old, from 25 years of journey. I think it's a, a great pleasure to hear you, sir. Uh, please uh, present, sir. Yeah. Dr. Chowde, sir. I think uh, Dr. Professor Chowde needs no introduction. Everyone knows who's uh, sitting here so well. He's been speaking for a long time. So everyone, each and everyone sitting there knows him so well. He's been speaking on radiations and he's a real master of peace and on his work. Uh, before he starts uh, his deliberation of application of ionizing radiation in healthcare 125 years of journey, I would request the repertoire to please note down the proceedings so that uh, in the end you can submit that. Uh, Professor Chogle, please. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Sucheta and yes, Matt, for uh, your kind introduction. After the delicious lunch, I hope uh, you will be listening to me because the hypoglycemic state where uh, people will be, I have to find out and click the photos. But, but you are online across the world. So please see that you are not closing. <laughs> okay, anyway. Uh, so I'll be talking today on application of ionizing radiation 
in particularly in healthcare in the morning i talked that x rays were discovered on 8th november 1895 i hope for the my ppt is visible to all of you so i'll be talking on application of ionizing radiation in healthcare 125 years of journey mm -hmm. as i told you that uh, in on 8th november 1895 x rays were discovered and immediately same year they were put into diagnosis the next day they came into therapy and today it is the important part of the healthcare system hospital small or large you need a facility of x ray at least if a larger one then the ct scan at other things now a healthy man has thousand wishes a sick man has only one and he want to be cured he want to remain healthy unless and until we diagnose the disease treatment is not possible so before the discovery of x ray before 8th november 1895 medical diagnosis was based on the symptoms palpitation occlusion physical examination but after 1895 a tool we have got in terms of x ray where we can fit into the human body and see inside the body just a small history i want to tell you the ronjens mother charlotte was suffering from a very very painful disease in 1881 he took her to a surgeon to a physician but they were not able to diagnose her disease he was in a, she was in agony he asked the surgeon please diagnose because she is unbearable pain the surgeon said i do not have a tool i do not have a equipment to pip into the human body see inside the body she died undiagnosed but this great man gave to the world in 1895 a tool to pip into the human body non invasively without entering without cutting without going into that thing not only we can see inside the body in your heart in your brain anything nothing is in evil from the doctors now everything is visible so we have lot of gadgets which uses x rays that x ray imaging ct gamma camera pet and all those things so imaging was totally in the medicine in the actually ground level and the only the mbbs who do not get any specialty they used to go to radiology today radiology was the first brand where toppers go so in 125 years radiology has evolved there's a technological evolution due to addition of computers imaging modalities we have moved from 2d to 3d to 4d technology live ct 
so this is the technology it has taken in morning i was talking about this is a place ulsburg uh, in the university where ronden discovered the excel all this equipment with this we has done it i had a fortune of last year visiting uh, his laboratory and i took a special permission to go inside and take photograph that was there so huge application of radiation in healthcare as you know destructive application of atomic bomb the 6th august and 9th august 1945 we know that uh, atom bombs were dropped on nagasaki and hiroshima that's a destructive application but now we can use that for a peaceful application and these peaceful applications are in agriculture are in industry are in medical field are in pharmaceutical and many other fields the applications are there of this radiation including the x ray and the radio isotopes because immediately after the discovery of x ray in 1896 radioactivity was discovered and madam curie uh, separated radium and polonium and radium came into immediate application for brachytherapy it was graham bell who said he was not with nothing to do with uh, this radiation but he said can we put this radioisotope to treat the cancer on the body and how the brachytherapy has started so i will not discuss on the uh, the destructive application but medical field agriculture archaeology even the antique element is correct or not even uh, the carbon dating we can find out the doors the wood is taj mahal old or new everything can be done so nuclear power industry even the jk tire uses for the thicknesses of the things radioisotopes uh, research consumer products space craft food industry now you say you know that uh, uh, you make aloo paratha it may get spoiled in 10 days but uh, army people who are in a terrain like 6 month out so you can irradiate them send to them this food particle food elements or uh, the uh, krushak is there in nashik where the onions and the potatoes are irradiated so sprouting doesn't take place our mangoes when you send it to us or something after 10 or 15 days overripening takes place we irradiate them you can do that thing so a lot of application but i will not go into those application i will restrict myself to the medical application they are in radiation oncology oncology is a science of cancer where we are using radiation as a tool to treating the cancer that's the radiation oncology we are talking about the nuclear medicine it's a branch of medicine where radio isotopes in the form of powder liquid or air in vivo in vitro are used for diagnosis and treatment is a nuclear medicine radio diagnosis where you use the radiation for a diagnosis the ailment and imaging that is radio diagnosis in cardiology where you want to have uh, the cardiography echocardiography and uh, other uh, uh, the stenting and everything you need the radiation so unscare this is the united nations scientific committee on effect of atomic radiation reports that about 4.5 billion diagnostic radiological procedures and 8 million radiotherapy procedures are taking place across the world बंद हो गई उनसे नहीं उनसे बंद हो गई ऑनलाइन में तो कोई दिक्कत नहीं ऑफलाइन में
Okay, so as I was, I was just talking about the unscaled United States report that 4.45 billion radiology every year happening. So every second person is undergoing radiological procedures uh, that is there. So medical application, they are in diagnosis as well as in therapy. In diagnosis, we use uh, low doses and short time exposure like X-ray, CT scan, or even PET scan. And uh, therapeutic, you use uh, very high radioactivity, very high doses. And uh, now cancer treatment, morning I talked about surgery, chemotherapy, and then hormone or immunotherapy, just I talked, which is being added. In radiotherapy, we have brachytherapy or teletherapy. In teletherapy, a radioactive source is away from your patient body and you are telling as a television, telephone at a distance. And brachytherapy or physiotherapy, where you are putting the radioactive sources into close proximity of the tumor, either on the tumor surface or inside the body or cavities or interstitial. And morning I talked about Emil Grube, uh, 29th March, 1896, just within three and a half months of the discovery of the X-ray, used the X-rays to treat a breast cancer, a Rose Lee woman, she treated, he treated the breast cancer with this and the radiotherapy has started. So just after the discovery of the X-ray, diagnosis has started and uh, the even the radiotherapy has started. So therapeutic application, radiotherapy, uh, you can use gamma rays coming out of radioisotope, electron beams from the, uh, the, the, uh, from the accelerators, X-ray radiation again from the accelerator, particle therapy that is the, uh, the protons, the neutrons, these particles are being treated. Brachytherapy, we have surface mold, intracavity, interstitial, and that morning also talk, removal, unremoval. Endovascular brachytherapy also was tried was there for 10 years. When you put a stain, what is called as a candy wrappers effect, that after five cc a restenosis takes place. And if you give radiation to the stain, what you have put it, uh, the, uh, the, the vascularization remains the same. It doesn't get closed. Uh, cancer is a big problem. See, cancer, one of the, uh, see, the lethal, 13% of the deaths occur because of the cancer. It is the first killing disease into the developing con uh, developed countries and second in the developing countries, but it will surplus within few years and that must be treated. And uh, as a treatment, I told you, radiotherapy immediately we started, surgery was earlier there and chemotherapy also. And uh, the development of uh, treatment of the cancer started initially, we have superficial X-ray machine. Technology wasn't developed. So initially in 1920s, 30s, we used to use only 50 kV or 100 kV X-rays, then became deep therapy X-rays, then became 1951, we have got a cobalt machine. There's a cobalt 60 source, which is produced into the nuclear reactor. We used to get it from the Canada. And now you must have read uh, two days back into the newspaper, the RAPP, Rajasthan Atomic Power Plant. It is now, earlier you know, even in Rajasthan, we used to get two to three years to get the radioisotope source to start our cobalt machine waiting for it. Now we are expor exporting thousands of kilocurry of radioactivity outside the country. That is the scientists, they have done it. So we have cobalt therapy. Then we have linear accelerator, which is a variable energy linear accelerator. You have six, depending upon the depth of the tumor, you can choose the energy, six, eight, 15, 20, whatever you want. You have the, uh, the, uh, the multi-leap collimator. Tumors are not square or rectangle. As the size is there, multi-leap collimator, just I will show you. I will uh, tell about the Linux. You have got imaging, everything we can do. Then we have a cyber knife where the stereotactic body radiotherapy can be done. Cyber knife is a six arm movement. So wherever tumor is there, like uh, you have a apple and little bit rotten. So what you'll do, you'll take a knife and you'll try to cut it. So SBRT is a radiation beam. You are moving around and covering that tumor, sparing the normal tissue. This is a technique. So it's completely confirming uh, you are doses to the normal tissue and critical organ goes down. This is the cyber knife uh, unit. Then we have a brachytherapy, multiple channel brachytherapy, and I'll show you. It has a radioisotope inside that thing. 
you plan it, connect the applicator, then make a click on the source will go into the applicator, treat the patient, the source will come out, go to the safe and all. So you can treat a multiple applicators you can use, you can treat the cervix vagina, you can treat prostate, you can do the imaging, ultrasound, online imaging, where actually the applicators are there, where the doses are there. So all kind of esophagus can be treated, breast can be treated, nasopharynx, prostate, vaginal cancer, cervical cancer with brachytherapy. And I, since 1895, you see first up to 90, 90, uh, 1950, only we have uh, deep or superficial therapy. 1951, we got a cobalt therapy. Then the Second World War, microwave technology and all gave rise to the linear accelerator in 1960s, Betatron. Then 1980s, we have a CT scanner that's a three-dimensional images. Our X-ray is a 2D image. 3D into cut section, you get it. Then you can do 3D planning, accurate dosimetry. Then 1990s, we have got MRI, magnetic resonance imaging positron emission tomography, then CT and PET is combined. Positron emission tomography gives you functional imaging. It gives you the molecular imaging. CT gives you the anatomical imaging. So you can choose those images. You can have the hybrid images. Similarly, we have a MR PET. So magnetic resonance and the PET scan into one machine. Then you have an image guided machine image on board image is happening image is guiding where to drop where to give radiation how much is to give sparing the normal tissue sparing the organ so this is how from the 2d to 3d to conformal to imrt technology we have moved into 125 years imrt means for example a tumor is there inside the body it will not be the same distance from the surface tumor is zigzag so I can have an intensity of the radiation depending upon the depth of the tumor that is intensity modulated radiotherapy. So it's a new technology, image guided radiotherapy. And then you have an arc, small arcs, and you can treat and rotate what I told a stereo tactically radiation can be given. You have to have a fixation, which is SRT for a Acular melanoma, eye melanoma, very, very small region of one or two centimeters. There should not be a dose pillage outside the target volume. So you have to fix up that thing. This is again pediatric SRT. And then now we have a volume image or a variable LINAC. You can see that there are cameras and there are X ray beams. They are tracking the tumor, breathing in, breathing out, movement, and all those things. And accordingly, when the tumor is exactly down, the beam will be off. When tumor is off, the, the beam will be off. So that is what a guided tracking system you have radio trap. And this is how it happens. Real-time tumor tracking system for a gated radiotherapy. Because you are in a thorax or in an abdomen, cancer is there. Treatment is going to be for 5 or 10 minutes. You are breathing in, breathing out. There is an internal movement of the organ. And then you will miss the target or you have to have a larger uh, margins. But here, a tracking will be there exactly tumor area. Yes, shoot it. If not, stop it. So that way, the unnecessary dose to the outside door. And here you can see breathing in, breathing out. Exactly tracking is happening with the cameras, with other things. And they're connected to machine. Then only the beam will be on. And this is what is the respiratory gating. You can do with a CT scanning, 4D CT. I told 2D, 3D, and with the time that is going, time I know. So we have simulator, we have CT scan, CT simulation before treating, because the large dose of uh, 10 gray, 15 gray, we are going to give it. So we have to simulate before giving radiation. So patient CT we do. Are I, am I going to give the radiation dose exactly the same place, this thing, and then replan? So that's a CT simulation. Then we have MRI, PET CT, 4D CT, 4D PET CT, CT MRI. All this is guiding me where to go, how to deliver. This is a guidance, imaging, and treating. And today's radiotherapy is this. You image it. You know what is the tumor size exactly. Accordingly, you plan it. And the multi-lip collimator moves, 
exactly to the covering to only tumor wherein they move and they do. So it's a precise, accurate dose. What it made about 40 years back, 20% was the cure rate of the radiotherapy because we have to stop radiation for the side effects. Now it is 80 to 85% because we are able to escalate those from 40 gray to 120 gray because exactly we are giving it to tumor only. Normal tissue is not a problem. So this is what is an accurate treatment. So it is like a, in first world war, carpet bombing means like that. There is an extremist in a city, blow up the city. But now what we are doing? We are doing a missile guided bombing. Exactly, not in Bikane, not entire this hall, in the hall who is a culprit. Exactly that will happen and that will be done. That is what is the radiotherapy is happening as a cellular basis. And this is very, very accurate radiotherapy. We are able to do that. We have another machine which has come in 2000 is a tomotherapy. Earlier you have to do the CT scan, MRI, bring the patient on the LINAC and then treat. Tomotherapy is, tomo is again a CT. In one machine you have a CT scan and a linear center both. So on the same table, same time you are scanning, planning, treating. No movement, nothing. So that is called as a tomotherapy machine available in India. Almost about 30 machines are available in India. And you can treat multiple the spine, uh, secondary or spinal cancer. Different spots, exactly you can do that. Red is almost 100% and the green area is very, very minimal. This is how I talked about the cyber uh, knife. It gives image guided stereotactic radiotherapy. Then we have a gamma knife. Gamma knife is like a knife. It uses 201 telecobalt sources, that is a cobalt 60 sources, and you can direct the beam in the center like that. Uh, you focus the thing, you go to the sunlight, uh, you put a paper, no fire will be there. But if you use the lens and convert it, the fire will be there. So like that, you convert all this radiation source coming and focus on a tumor and treat brain tumors. Then we have an MR linear magnetic resonance imaging with the linear oscillator. I talk about the tomotherapy where CT scan and linear oscillator. This is there where in a one machine you are doing MRI and you are giving radiotherapy. This is a MR LINAC. So this has come in 2018 and almost about 120 units in Europe and other things have come. We have an intraoperative radiotherapy. Many times you must have seen a breast cancer is operated, then a surgeon will say, three weeks wound heal, wound heal, and then radiotherapy, then you have to take one month radiotherapy. Now, there and there itself in the surgery, surgery is done, the linear oscillator is there, intraoperative. You treat that thing, close, that's all. No, after that radiotherapy is required. So it's intraoperative radiotherapy. And depending, earlier for a breast cancer treatment of radical mastectomy, complete removal of the breast, trauma to the patient, to the female, then lumpectomy. Now it is also gone. You have a small hole, put the applicator, inflate the applicator, connect to the brachytherapy machine, give the radiation, deflate it. Gone. So no part loss, no defigurement, nothing. This is a mammosat or brachytherapy for the brain. Again, for as I'm telling you, in head and neck cancers also, the tumor in the neck, you can operate it and then immediately you can do radiotherapy. Then we have a particle therapy, proton. We have in Apollo cancer in Chennai, proton, very expensive, yes. That there you can see that the radiation of a photon, it can go. So we can have an exit dose or the underneath the tumor, normal tissue gets a dose. But there it has got the range. After that it is stopped. So radiation will enter, goes on in the tumor, comes out, exactly covering that thing. So this is a proton therapy. Here you can see the peak proton. It goes and then other photons and other that they go on depositing. So this is the advantage of the particle therapy proton or carbon. Then we have PET CT become main instrument of radiotherapy planning. And as I know, every center is going for the CT PET. I will not go into the details of this thing. Then I come to the nucleus. So, so the tremendous 
uh, advantages high tech things have happened into radiotherapy in a nuclear medicine i talked the branch of the medicine where you use the uh, radio isotope open or sealed or unsealed everything for diagnosis in vivo studies in vitro studies radio immunose ria ttt ports and hormonal studies uh, then therapy for toxic uh, thyrotoxicosis thyroid cancer bone mate and lot of research is happening and in the vivo into the body so for example there is a internal bleeding we want to find out blood loss we want to find out so loss of pressure from the body internal bleeding gi blood loss excretion rate turnover rate blood volume study how much is the blood into the body that's the inversion technique we can put little bit of uh, uh, chromium 59 tag with the blood again put into the body dilution take it out and how much times dilution has taken place depending upon that thing then you have a dynamic function studies like optic thyroid optic studies renal studies liver scan bone scan brain scan all sort of things we can do so organ function studies cardiac perfusion lung muscles are functioning or not functioning you can do pulmonary perfusion organ imaging mapping so physiological studies spec glucose consumption that is a 18 fdg depending upon that thing is a malignant or benign many times you treat a cancer for a brain tumor and if you do the ct there will be residue it's a dead debris it's a calcified or living we have to do the pet scan this will tumor activity so nuclear medicine therapy i talked about thyrotoxicosis uh, nuclear medicine equipments are required and this is a bone scan entire bone scan you can do earliest the bone malignancy secondary is by the bone scan you can find out wherever uptake is large uptake is more how we can do that thing and here again you can see that uh, Uh, the ribs uh, thing where the activity has been picked up secondary so press studies i will not go into the detail number of sources gamma camera for taking the images by uh, uh, giving radio isotope orally gamma emitting you can give to the patient is a radio pharmaceutical it will go to the liver the gamma camera on the liver uh, patient the liver you get a image of the liver the bone renal all those things are there the nuclear imaging this is a cardiac imaging renal imaging liver imaging you can do functionality then uh, these are the positron emission tomography renogram the uh, kidney is functioning properly or not both isn't it right and left kidney it is a, a phase accumulation and excretion which right kidney is not functioning because ivp intravenous pyelography is a late stage and other thing but this gives the early physiology of the renal this thing kidney imaging bladder imaging you can do it so these are the variety of isotopes after 1935 we have artificial radioactivity you can prepare the radio isotope into the nuclear reactor into the cyclotron and we have more than 200 radio isotopes being used into uh, our body total body irradiation for organ transplantation you want to immunize the thing you can give the uh, the uh, radiation to whole body so that uh, your organ is not rejected even blood irradiation when blood transfusion is being done we irradiate with the blood irradiation then i come down to radio diagnosis and imaging and as i told you that one third of the all medical diagnosis except for your 4.5 million radiological procedure more than 80000 x-ray machine in india more than 1500 new x-ray machines are being added in india they can give you a static study in just a chest x-ray or a spine x-ray but dynamic studies fluoroscopy and angiography live how the barium is going in barium solo barium meal barium enema all sort of studies can be done and this is how x-ray beam comes uh attenuation takes place and you find on the x-ray film or now the digital it's a digital film you get images and this was the first x-ray of anna bartha ludwig uh, uh taken <clears throat> by uh, ronjen and this is what musculoskeletal uh, you have dislocation you have a, a bone um, fracture you have arthritis so x-ray is a common facility maybe two or three things okay and this is ivp intravenous pyelography when you inject inject a contrast media you can see the arteries the veins and other things you can see so you have in modern imaging mammography for breast imaging cr image intensifier tv which theaters also we use 
mass miniature radiography, digital radiography, digital subtraction angiography, computed tomography, spiral multi slice CT. Today we have a CT scanners of 640 slices, one rotation. The first uh, CT scanner took five minutes for one slice and just to scan a head one hour. Today, in two seconds from Head to toe, we can scan. Two seconds, head to toe. 640 scans in one rotation, sub-second. Huge amount. PET CT, PACS, picture archiving communication system. Imaging is done here, and you can get a, uh, the report from USA or USA done, you can get it from here. This is the mobile, uh, this is the cat lab equipment, this is the ortho pentogram, that we can ortho pentogram. This is a CT scan how the images are obtained in the axial mode, cut section mode mein hum kaise le sakte hai. All these things, cardiac angiography mein, how your uh, uh, avatars and the walls are working properly. And subtraction mein, uh, same image is taken with bone, with skin, with muscle. But I don't want bone and all. Just you have to make that, no need to take imaging. It's a digital image, subtract. You only get arteries of this thing. You want with muscle, you can get with that thing. So these are the advantage playing with images. Virtual endoscopy. Aapko pet mein endoscope dalne ke zaroorat nahi hai. CT scan kar liya from mouth to anus. Where is a blockade? How it is going? You can see without putting any external endoscope. That's a virtual. Everything you can do it. The dual energy. In a dual energy, you have to bone, bhi dikh rahe, artery, bhi dikh rahe, brain matter, there are two energy. 80 kb, one is 120 kb. Karta hai. And you can see beautiful images of the dual energy city available in Rajasthan, available in India. This was in time, Zojar Kar mein aaya tha, uh, the heart attack, how to stop. Before it happens, you can do, yes, by CT NGO. Yeah, so, sorry, just, 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 just last one. Uh, here you can see that how you can go ahead and you can interruption arahai to roll of the CT to detect early this thing it can come. But be aware that radiation can cause that cancer, skin burn, cataract, infertility, genetic. So you have to take care of that thing with this thing. I end my talk. Radiation application has a huge application and it is a part and partial of our thing. But imaging has to be done very wisely. Thank you very much. Really very nice presentation. I would like to intimate all students. May, many of the instruments, equipment, shown by Dr. Chogule, most of them are available in the other also. Yeah. You go to other institutions, can you can visit. Sir, uh, being a security of ISRB, many times my faculty members and my students, they ask me, sir, you are going to organize interested conference with radiation biology. Nowadays, the COVID time is there. Is there any treatment from radiation of the corona? Yes. It's, that, it's a, it's yeah. a question by the audience. Yeah. So see what happened was the low dose radiotherapy was being used in 1930s to 1940s when there were no antibiotics for pneumonia. And they used to get a very good result that time no cobalt machine, no linear center. From X-ray just give the chest radiation, not chest X-ray, chest radiation a little more. And the pneumonia was vanished within uh, about 12 hours to 24 hours. And then after this COVID, they thought, why not we can try this thing? And it is tried. First trial happened in Ames, Delhi. And they tried that whenever cytochrome storm is there, the spasm occurs, lung areoles get choked in, no air can go oxygen. You are deprived of oxygen, which is free, but you are strangulated. But you give the radiation, the edema releases quickly within four to eight hours, and you are normal. You start breathing and things. Ten trials in India happened. 35 trials across the world other than this 10 have happened. They have got a very good result. Only limitation is bringing this patient to a linear accelerator, using that linear accelerator, contamination bringing, that was the thing. But if a dedicated unit and dedicated thing is there, it works. And that is called as low dose radiotherapy. 
for covid treatment lot of article lot of paper lot of interest lot of uh, the uh, things uh, phase 1 2 3 trials we call it they are happening and there is coming only thing see availability feasibility acceptability so these are the things one has to see yes by science is doable it is workable how can you make it into clinical and practicable that is the thing to be said thank you professor chaudhary going back to your initial lecture I would say it was a very enlightening one, and especially for those who are sitting here, these upcoming scientists, uh, they would uh, have learned a lot about the technology right from its history to the modern day usage. And if there are any questions regarding the lecture Professor Sir has given, uh, you are free to ask now. I just give permission for one or two questions. Yeah. Your past yeah. upcoming yes, yes, please, ma'am. Because I'm not a student of science, I'm from humanities. But your lecture was immensely interesting. I was able to get everything that you were saying. One thing that really concerns me is that you talk about all the sophisticated, you know, machines and the dialysis cells and the therapies and all. The more sophisticated an instrument is, the more cost for the middle class person to take those than than us and them. Uh, through this platform, because you know there are international viewers of this uh, content. I just want to say that scientists and doctors need to do something about this to just reduce the the, the cost for a middle class person so that they can take up all this new uh, whatever you know invention and the things that are going on in medical science that comes in reach of the middle class. Yes, your question is very pertinent. That uh, these are very high tech equipment. They need a lot of uh, cost, and the cost entail goes to the patient and all. But governments are very kind. Ayushman Bharat or even Rajasthan Sanjeevani and other schemes, you will be happy to know that more than 80% of the patient they get complete free treatment or reimbursement from this thing. And in a government hospital, if you go to our uh, this uh, Tulsi hospital, almost it is free. Your treatment can cost five thousand or ten thousand, not in lakhs. But private hospital, they are not a charity organization. They have to put the equipment. They have to earn from that thing. And regarding the research, yes, a lot of research is going on to bring the proton therapy cost down. And uh, hopefully, it will be prototype they have developed, and in a small area, small thing they can do. The researchers are doing. And uh, in the government of India, at least uh, our schemes of doing this thing, indigenization and this thing. and i will tell you that uh, uh, to, to about 10 years back we used to import the cobalt machine we have a babatron machine which is developed by brc manufactured by panacea india not only in india iaea has given donated to many other countries prime minister has donated to mongolia to namibia to vietnam and all so we have a cobalt plant indigenous they have brought out the linear accelerator in india pet scan is also coming up. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, sir. It's a very good uh, presentation, sir. Uh, actually, you are uh, given the cream of uh, all about the radiotherapy. I think it's an eye-opening session. Uh, congratulate, sir. And it is very useful for the young generation that knowing about the different types of radiotherapy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So my question is that uh, we are working on the biosensor, optical approach, and we are working on the optical properties of the cancer cells. Using the optical properties, we are trying to make the high sensitive detector for cancer. I got your point. There is a huge project of NCI, National Cancer Institute, and uh, in USA, two billion. physics of cancer physical properties you take a cell and you go into the microscope and see it's a cancer or not but by change of the physical properties you can diagnose without taking a biological sample the uh, the raman spectroscopy and one of my phd student has done already work on raman spectroscopy just by reflection of the waves changing waves of the spectra you can differentiate between the malignant and benign thing 
so that is there and that is what i am telling to youngsters and everybody huge scope to do that thing it is not the only traditional based uh, uh, diagnostic system but newer modalities based on properties of physics properties and that is a big consortium can physics of cancer now biology of a cancer so we are studying that thing thank you so much thank you, thank you. Now I will move on to the next speaker, and this Dr. Asiti Kanta Sharma. She will be speaking on physical processes in radiation biology. She is from Radiation Biology Laboratory. He, okay, sorry, Asiti Kanta. I just saw it's a female, but okay, sorry, sir. Uh, he is a um, scientist in the Radiation Biology Laboratory, Intel University Accelerator Center. Aruna Asakali Mark, that's the address. That's only the introduction which has been given to me about uh, uh, this uh, renowned person. So he's going to speak on physical processes of radiation biology online. So uh, good afternoon uh, to all the esteemed uh, uh, scientists over here. Am I audible? Okay. Am I also visible? Yes, yes. All right. Thank you so much. So uh, what I will do now, I will share my screen and uh, and uh, now I will go to right so yeah is it all right now? Yeah. Is the slide coming? Okay, yeah. all right. So uh, uh, first of all, let me congratulate. Uh, uh, the organizers for uh, uh, having such a fantastic uh, uh, bimodal uh, presentation uh, schedules. And my talk is uh, dedicated to the young generation. And I am very much uh, uh, happy to know that there is a radiation biology department in the uh, Dungar Government College. That is a really, really encouraging uh, uh, news, you can say, okay, or uh, encourage, encouraging information. So I belong to Inter University Accelerator Center, and uh, I run uh, a facility here for heavy and radiation biology, which uh, one of the applications is uh, uh, carbon therapy, proton therapy. But uh, here I will be talking about uh, physical processes which go on in the radiation biology uh, studies uh, to understand. So since I have, as I told that this is dedicated towards the young generation, so I hope you would uh, be enjoying it. All right. So, uh, so what uh, uh, the thing is that a uh, little bit of figures that uh, the first radiation biology experiment was done by a nuclear physicist, Thomas Becquerel. The Pierre Curie, Pierre Curie, another nuclear physicist who started doing the radiation biology experiments. Okay. And he uh, basically uh, did uh, experiments on the cat poles and uh, saw lots of mutagenesis there. Uh, and uh, uh, different kinds of uh, cellular uh, lesions also available uh, to his uh, uh, studies. And he published, I mean, uh, tried to publish it. And uh, in fact, uh, those, uh, those days, the conferences were there and he presented his papers, but then the biologists over there, uh, they never showed an interest. So Pierre Curie would have definitely done a lot, but he unfortunately died in a road accident. So skin cancer was, radiation induced skin cancer uh, was reported in 1992. And as uh, all of you know that uh, both Madam Query and uh, her daughter both died of uh, cancer, uh, radiation induced cancer. And uh, of course, the, uh, by the time the systematic studies started, it was uh, quite uh, late in 1920s or so. And uh, then the problem which people faced is that the uh, quantification, what, what I am doing, I'm seeing certain uh, results, but with what I am going to correlate it. 
that is the quantification of what I'm doing. Okay. So in ca case of radiation, it is also called radiation dose. Okay. In case of any other, any other uh, experiments like uh, with any other reagent you do, that also you call uh, kind of dose or whatever you, way you define it. So radiation biology, people started putting lots of interest because when the Hiroshima Nagasaki affair happened, then uh, so many people died, then and there dying, then, then and there is nothing. Okay, because lots of heat wave is there, lots of shock wave is there. Uh, so people dying there, it, it is something else. But what happened is that the aftermath, after 20 years, 30 years, generations after generations, you know, the problems starting. So people started thinking that, okay, we must put some serious thought to it. And by the time, uh, the Americans also uh, started having the accelerators and they started putting uh, also more ideas into how to put accelerators into uh, health uh, sector. Okay. All right. So let us now go to, uh, yeah, the physical processes. Now, this radiation interacts with a system and there are uh, methods which what happens is that something called a excitation. A system is there, a molecular system, okay? And uh, so there has to be uh, excitation if there is an interaction, some perturbation has to be there. And then another process is called ionization. That means what is ionization? The radiation has to have sufficient energy to eject one or two orbital electrons, all right? Now, having sufficient energy, that is a very tricky situation, very tricky concept. We'll see to it a little later. So what is ionizing radiation? So ionizing radiation, uh, let us re remember that X-ray, gamma ray, these are called ionizing radiation, okay? The particulate radiation is also ionizing radiation. There is neutrons, even electrons, uh, which, uh, okay? But uh, electron I am not specifically telling because ultimately you will see all the game is played by electrons. Okay? And then of course, charged particles, as we said, protons or any other, any other charged particle. For therapy, we are, standardized now to cheap therapy, cheap therapy, protons. Uh, good therapy, but very expensive is carbon. All right. And uh, then in biological material, the electromagnetic radiation is considered ionizing if the photon energy is in excess of 124 electron volts. Photon means the, the, the wave packet, the, the packet of energy. Uh, that has to be 124 electron volts. And this corresponds to a uh, wavelength that is uh, 10 nanometers or 100 angstroms, all right? And so in that case, you will see that ultraviolet is not ionizing. All, although ultraviolet creates problem uh, by some other process, you know, dimerization and things like that. All right. Now the energy deposited in the tissues, they are actually, as I told you, this is photons. That means in discrete packets. These packets are, you know, uh, having certain energy that there's a, enough to break the chemical bond and initiate a chain of events. Now, critical difference between the ionizing and non-ionizing radiation is the size of the packet. Okay, of which means how much energy is contained within that packet. Now, if you take a gross example, the total energy given, and this example is actually from uh, Eric Hall's book, okay, very famous example, you can go through it. So we all know that if you uh, irradiate a uh, normal human being or uh, any other living system by on an average by four gray, uh, this is uh, half of the, it is uh, half, half of the population, you know, the statistical half of the population will have a, a little effect. Now, what is this four gray? Now, four gray means, uh, we'll come to this later on, that gray defined, gray is defined as joules per kilogram. I take one kilogram of uh, tissue and give one joule of energy to it. That we say that, okay, is one gray. Now, the question is that, is that energy uniformly distributed? Now, in that case, suppose you have a mass of human being is 70 kilos, and you give four gray, 
this is basically a simple calculation will reveal that this actually uh, uh, equal to uh, one sip of hot coffee. All right. Or uh, if, you, if you lift your friend by 40 centimeters, that is also little. So quite nonsense, right? Okay. You, you, you do not have a, a semi-little, uh, uh, I mean, <laughs> dose by taking one sip of coffee. Now, this means that this energy is not given as a whole, okay? It is the energy which is contained in this packet, okay? The web packet. Now, let us go to some other uh, situation here. All right. So what is this physics and chemistry and biochemistry and biology related to radiation? So when the primary event starts, that is physics problem, the, uh, rather the physi physics procedures, they take 10 to the power minus 16 seconds. Within that, what do you have? The primary interaction with the radiation. This will have, uh, the chain is like that interaction with the biological molecules or interaction with the water. So you must have already uh, uh, read a lot about it, something called a radiolysis, okay? So the electrons which are ejected, first is electrons are ejected, taking out, and these electrons will interact either with the biological molecules directly or interact with water, and thus hydroxyl radical uh, or and hydrogen radical, they will be coming together. And this water, uh, okay, or biological molecules, all over will be excitation will be there or ionization will be there and molecular uh, packages will be there. Uh, rather the chemistry will start. So the chemistry once it starts, that is one millisecond, okay, within that, I mean, uh, millisecond range. So what are radicals? Then these uh, radicals will be diffusing out. They will uh, uh, interact with the biomolecules, deposit their energy, then chemical restitution repairs, everything will start, okay, those change. Then the biochemistry, that is basically chemistry only, but uh, taking, uh, involving the, all the biomolecules, then the fixation of damage will be there, enzymatic repair will be there, all sorts of things will, one by one, one by one, the chain will be completed. And the effect what we'll see is biology, okay, macrobiology, that means your hours in days, okay? So we'll see. And in between, definitely we have diff uh, different protocols to monitor the uh, progression of these uh, biochemical reactions, okay? All right. Now, let us go to the next part. That is, we heard a lot about the uh, uh, different photon interactions and uh, IMRT and uh, all. So to understand that, uh, we need to know how does photon interact with the matter. Matter means any matter. The physics does not change. For us, it is biological matter. So what changes is basically Z value. Z value, the atomic number of the constituents. Okay, in a biological ma uh, material, what we have, mainly carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, some nitrogen, and then uh, in a little amount, other uh, all other materials, obviously. So suppose a narrow beam of photons, eh? this white packets, okay. The, the photons are passing through a medium of thickness of delta X. Delta X means small increment in the thickness of tissue, suppose, okay, or any other material. So uh, this, the, the property of the photons is that either they are there or they are not there. It is different from the particles. Particles, once they interact, they will slow down. They will gradually lose the energy and then stop. But photons, they don't stop. Either they are there or they are not there. Okay. So the number decreases. Okay. So the final number and initial number, the difference is delta n. Okay. So we say that delta n is proportional to a, the thickness and the initial number of photons and also a constant called mu. Okay. So this is uh, uh, basically a prop property of the material and also the property of the uh, mutual property, uh, uh, mutual uh, interaction 
uh, between the radiation and the material. Okay, so uh, this is called the linear attenuation coefficient. Uh, basically, if this is a uh, this is a uh, differential equation, and if you solve this differential equation, you will find this is a famous Beer's law, right? So n is equal to n zero e to the power minus d x. You must have already studied it. Radiation biology course. Okay, so this new is a linear attenuation coefficient, and uh, it is the probability of interaction of a photon or linear path length of the material. Probability. Okay. Yeah. Now, once we have this, the we, we can also have we can also calculate how much is the energy absorbed in the material. But you see, this energy uh, the, uh, absorbed is, uh, suppose n number of photons are coming after a delta x thickness, this n number of photons doesn't remain as n number, it will become something else, n prime number. So as it goes on varying, so the energy, total energy absorbed will be also varying, okay? So those, so to say, those, uh, absorbed dose in this material also will also vary as the photon keeps on traversing. Okay, yeah. So how to calculate this absorbed dose? We can uh, have this formula here. You can you can see that uh, delta E absorption is uh, a function of uh, mu absorption, uh, attenuation coefficient, and this mu absorptions are available as a standard table. You can Google search it. There are many nuclear physics books and atomic physics books are there where this particular values are listed. Suppose we have got X-ray energy or gamma energy at, uh, and the, the material, you can simply find out at what energy or what material and what kind of mu uh, absorption will be there. Okay, from there, you can easily calculate. So if you have tissue, you have carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen main constituents. From each of them, you can find out, add them up, and you will be able to find out the mu absorption. Okay. So let us come to the interaction of gamma and uh, uh, X-ray. So in a biological material, as we told earlier also, the electromagnetic radiation is considered ionizing if the photon energy is excess of 124 electron volts. Okay. Now, this electromagnetic radiation do not produce the damage themselves. And same formula, I mean, <laughs> same statement is true for the particle radiation also. Okay, the proton which is coming from the accelerator or the carbon which is coming from the accelerator, they do not do anything to the cell. Okay, because their size is in a femtometers. Okay, and they simply go past uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the number of particles with uh, they're so small corresponding to the Avogadro number is nothing. And also, the photons also don't do, do anything. Neutrons, they don't do anything. They simply pass through. All right. So, what? What uh, then? Uh, uh, what is the reason? Uh, the, it is the electrons uh, which uh, are liberated because of this ionizing radiations. They play the game. Okay. So, to uh, for the X-ray and uh, gamma ray, that means the ionizing photons. There are three processes are there by which we get the electrons out. Okay. So number one is called photoelectric effect. Now this photoelectric effect, this uh, uh, basically incoming photon is there. They interact with K, L, or M shells electrons, and then they go out. And uh, in a result, uh, they basically give sufficient energy to the electrons, so they are released. All right. So this kinetic energy of the electrons, that is nothing but the difference between the binding energy and the photon energy, okay, H nu minus B, all right? So uh, let us see uh, on which they depend on. One thing is that the, the probability, the cross-section varies as one upon E cubed, approximately. That means energy, the more the energy, lesser is the photoelectric effect. All right, it is E cubed. I mean, yeah, inversely proportional to E cubed. Now, it also involves the bound electron, and the attenuation cross section varies at Z three. 
That means if, if you increase the atomic number of the atomic number of the attenuator, okay, the the uh, probability of attenuation increases. So that's why to stop photons, okay, we you require you don't stop by a paper which contains carbon. You use the lead, okay. So the more and more heavier you go in the Z, the better is the attenuation process. All right. So that's why the shieldings are designed in that way. Okay. All right. The next thing is called the. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. It is. Uh, uh, yeah, this is photoelectric. Where is the next one gone? Mm, okay. This is, of course, the photoelectric thing only. So I am not uh, going for this. Yeah. So let's go to the Compton process. The Compton process is uh, imagine that if uh, I am going and I am colliding with a person and I am simply giving a kick to the electron that person is having. So the recoil, the kick, the photon gives a kick to the electron that it encounters, which is associated with a, a atom there. And this recoil electron creates the, uh, uh, I mean, further uh, uh, is all activities. I mean, it, it, it goes on creating, I mean, it becomes an electron now, a free electron now, right? So this is called the Compton effect. So almost all the uh, therapeutic things, or what you see uh, is because of the Compton effect. So, the photon gets scattered from the electron and uh, it uh, to conserve the momentum, it's a two billiard balls are colliding with each other. One goes this way, another goes this way. But then the, the momentum is different. So conserve the momentum. Okay, the electron is basically, the photon does not go like this. It gives a little kick to the kick to the electron. So that is called a recoil. So, and then since the photon has uh, given some energy to the electron, it becomes a new photon then, okay? Its identity becomes different. And then it can have another collision and ultimately it will escape the system. Okay, so the, the whole process goes on like this. So this, uh, uh, this kinetic energy imparted to the electron uh, that is utilized for the further interactions. Okay? So the last line is important. The Compton process is most important for energy absorption in soft tissues for energies in the range of 100 kilo electron volt to 10 mega electron volt, MEV. Yeah. So then comes something called a pair production. This is a total intranuclear process where if the photon energy is above in excess of 1022 keV, okay? So uh, then of course you will have a pair of electron and positron created and then electron goes and positron is uh, uh, highly the, 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 their antiparticle, right? So they will catch hold of another electron and immediately they will annihilate. So you'll get uh, 511 keV again. So two more photons will come out, okay? So the threshold is 1022 and the cross section, that means probability rapidly increases above this. All right. Yeah, that is another process, which is very important. It's called called Bremsstrahlung. Now, Bremsstrahlung is uh, basically a breaking, uh, uh, breaking uh, interaction, Bremsstrahlung, okay? The when you, when you break, uh, the, uh, rather when you uh, stop a charged particle, the, the radiation which comes out, that is called Bremsstrahlung, breaking radiation. Okay? Yeah, Strahlung is radiation. So as a high-speed electron or any other particle passes through a, uh, passes, uh, through a material, and uh, that means it interacts with the nucleus, there will be a Coulombic force that will deflect the path of the electron. And in the case of the electron, the mass of the nucleus is so much large, there will be little disturbance to the electron, right? Very heavy, yeah. So now what happens ultimately is that uh, uh, by a certain uh, deacceleration process, that energy is converted into uh, photon energy. And this Bremsstrahlung process is used for Linux. So although linear accelerator uh, for therapy it is used, but actually we are doing the photon therapy. So 
okay so linear accelerators basically we are accelerating uh, uh, through a certain acceleration accelerator accelerator physics process uh, to a high energy maybe 8 mv or more uh, like that uh, to uh, electrons and they are stopped and then what we get is the high energy x rays okay high energy x rays normal x rays are not high energy uh, by by normal procedure by the uh, by the uh, diagnostic uh, x rays which are produced they are not very high energy but with a linear accelerator you can have a very very high energy x rays and with that uh, uh, you can do the therapies all right so the, for the diagnostic radiology this is uh, okay this is a different technology altogether it's by the differential uh, uh, you know differential absorption by which you can see the the whole x ray image is basically differential absorption right so for, but the therapy in to get rid of the differential absorption in tissues uh, high energy x rays so these are the electrolinux so many hospitals are having it and of course only having the x ray high energy x rays not the game okay game is uh, what kind of advanced uh, 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 cancer system you have or uh, what kind of imrt you are have, going to have all right so for imrt the one needs to understand dr sir sorry to interrupt you we are running short of time so please request yeah yeah, yeah. actually uh, uh, my uh, Thing was designed in a that way. We'll we'll try to I'll try to see. Yeah. So you see this uh, neutron interactions. There are various a uh, neutron doesn't interact with the biological matter directly. So it interacts with the carbon and oxygen in the available, especially the carbon and and especially the protons. Okay, water. The protons once you interact, then with the indirect system it becomes a heavy ion, and that is how the neutrons uh, interact. so the how how the charged particle interact is the same way the charged particle going is a atomic process by which one ele electron is ejected okay that electron takes care of the rest okay i would like to skip this now radiation biology students there are very question i will ask you why do you think dna is the candidate for your uh, radiation damage Who tells you? Yeah, this is told by the atomic physicist, and uh, this is this particular figure is from uh, uh, Professor Kraft's paper, Gerard Kraft's paper, and Michel Scholz. Okay, so the the funda is that the maximum probability of electrons imparting uh, uh, energy energy to a system, all right, when the when the mean free path is the minimum, okay. of interactions and that is the maximum that that mean free path is in the diameter of the dna so that's why the maximum damage is on the dna otherwise as a whole any biological material is a candidate these things you will not get in internet you have to read papers for that yeah high quality radiation <laughs> biology papers that uh, i will talk about the a little bit about the charged particles the interactions you must have heard about the track structure there uh, most probably in your textbook you have heard about the track track structure now track structure you know you can see in the double lock system here double lock uh, uh, you, you you can see the uh, in the in the center of the track is a even enormous amount of doors okay 10 to the power 7 grade but that is a actually theoretical but as it goes that as it goes towards the uh, periphery towards the radial direction approximately uh, 1.23 microns the structure basically fades out okay so this is the this is called the penumbra radius so this formula is this if you can remember that is fine that is the it is a function of the specific energy that is energy of the particle per unit mass all right so this is the track structure this you will find maybe in internet uh this is for protons and this is for carbons you can see the density of the tracks here okay and why why uh, this density of the tracks is important will come little later now 
Okay, as I said, this uh, unit is gray and uh, goes in it, but it is, uh, it, it don't take it uh, literally. Okay, there is problem in this definition. Okay, so then comes the linear energy transfer, LET. Don't say left. Many, I have heard many radiation biologists telling left is incorrect. That is called LET, linear energy transfer. Okay, this is the definition. That means uh, how much energy you were, you were depositing into the system for unit length. So once again, I request you to please. This uh, I am going to uh, skip. Uh, uh, this is uh, how uh, I think uh, Dr. Chogale had shown some things, but uh, this you will get, these are the simulations what we have done in our labs. Uh, when you treat the tumor, it is not this fellow, it is, it is not this, what you do. What you do is that uh, you do something called SOBP, spread over Bragg peak, all right? So whatever is find in the internet, that is basically half truth, art satya. So anyway, we do not have time much to appreciate. Uh, this is another information. As you increase the LET, we would have thought that, that it is going to have more cell killing efficiency, but it is not so. The cell killing basically drops, okay, as you increase the LET. So the uh, range is approximately 100, 100 to 1000 uh, kV per micron. All right, so this I'll skip. This, uh, uh, this is a certain concept called direct and indirect effect. Many people do not understand this very clearly. Direct effect is called the electron damage, damage by the, by the electrons, not the particles, or by the photons, done by the electrons, and indirect by the radicals. Now a very important issue. Uh, I'll just take two minutes extra for that, is that uh, this is something called your the sparsely ionizing radiation, that means the photons and uh, the densely ionizing radiation, what is the difference between the ionization sites or the damage sites in a cell? Okay. How, how does it happen? You can see. All right. And some, you see the, uh, something called a simple base damage or something called a cluster damage. There is some nomenclature problem is there. So many people say the uh, high elite radiation or particle radiation create cluster damage. Actually, it is not cluster damage is also created by the low LED radiation. Okay, high LED radiation causes complex cluster damage. Okay, so this I would like to skip. There are many results over there. Okay, now little bit of concept. As you all we know, the RBE. Okay, these particular things are all done in my lab here. The survival curves and the, with gamma and particle, you can compare. This is the definition of RBE that is called relative biological effectiveness. Okay, this is very much important in case of treatment designing, treatment planning for uh, charged particle, okay, with protons or carbon, whatever you wish. So there are very important curves are there. You see the RBE, if you change the LET, because we have seen that uh, if uh, as the particle goes uh, deeper into the system, deeper in the tumor, the LET is also going to change and the particle is also going to face not a single kind of uh, uh, cells, but different kinds of cells, okay, or different stages of its uh, 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 replication. There are various things will be there. The tumor is not a simple tumor. It's a, it's a complicated issue, right? So in this RBC, it changes the depends on the survival level of the cells. It also depends on what kind of particle it is using. Okay, it goes whether is the cell the the uh, the cancer cell is repair proficient or repair deficient. Okay, so all these things one needs to take into account. So that's why the physical dose, which is being people say that okay, I have given this much dose, so that is not a very relevant issue. So when the treatment planning is done. The, the different models are created, okay? The, the available mathematical models are there uh, from taking data from different kinds of cell lines. So it is not that just doing on animals. The cell, the experiments on the cell lines is the starting point, okay? And now you can see, this is just straight over bracket, all right? 
And uh, you, you can see these dotted lines are basically, this is a physical dose. With a spread over, back peak, it is a physical dose. But these things are the biological dose, the response to the different kind of cell lines, T1, B79, R2D2, everything. So on that basis, you need to calculate out and the plan the treatment. I mean, is this a just a just a diagrammatic thing from a paper? Okay. So if you for the young students again, if you do not want to be a tourist in a tourist place, please try to read these books. One is Quantitative Mathematical Models in Radiation Biology by Kiefer, late Professor Jurgen Kiefer, Biological Radiation Effects. Then, of course, Edward Elpen's book. So these three books, especially if you read, you will not be a tourist in the tourist place. And of course, this book is uh, uh, available everywhere, Radiobiology for the Radiologist. Okay, very good book. This is a very good book. And the plethora of papers. So please go to them. You will really enjoy it. Okay, enjoy the subject. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sikanda, and I'm really sorry because you were short of time, so I have to request you. Uh, you really elaborated on the physical processes in radiation biology very minutely at the molecular level. And if there are any questions from the audience, please. Okay, no questions. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Moving on further. There are three more speakers left, and they're all the oral present presenters. And if uh, they can hear me, uh, Dr. Manu Saini, Dr. Priyanka Sharma, and Nandini K. Sri Ramchandra. I would request all the three participants that uh, you would be limited to only 10 minutes for your deliberation. So please stick to the time because we are run running short of time. Uh, the next speaker I would invite is Dr. Manu Saini, who would be speaking on the role of neutrophil extracellular traps. That is next in whole body 64 gamma irradiation induced damage in mice, implications in radiation protection. Now she's a student of Dr. Madhubana, uh, having a very good research experience and technical skills. She has published over seven papers. She's a recipient of various awards, including the Young Scientist Award and MR Raju Award. She has presented her papers in various international and national level conferences and workshops. She's a recipient of uh, very important fellowships. One is a National Postdoc Fellowship from NPDM SCRP, sir, mm -hmm. and another senior research fellowship mm -hmm. from SRM ICMR. She's a member of professional bodies and a very good uh, researcher. I now invite uh, Dr. Man for her presentation, please. Thank you so much, ma'am, for such a nice presentation and uh, introduction. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my work. Today, I will be topping, uh, talking on the topic role of neutrophil extracellular traps in whole body 60 cobalt gamma irradiation induced damage in mice, implications in radiation protection. The long-term objective of this study is development of a radioprotective agent. Since we all know that unwanted exposure of ionizing radiation is becoming an increasing concern due to the uh, increase in nuclear or radiation accidents. Also, low LET ionizing radiation is being increasingly used in therapeutics. So a radio protector is needed for such planned and unplanned activities to protect the normal tissues from the radiation damage. In the whole body radiation exposure to medium to high doses of radiations, exacerbation of innate immune response Low uh, increase in low inflammatory cytokines and bone marrow syndrome dominate the picture of acute radiation damage. In our uh, department at uh, uh, in mass, we have uh, uh, done a couple of studies and have shown the alteration in inflammatory markers after the radiation exposures and their modification with her uh, herbal radio protectors. We have shown uh, the uh, alteration in the levels of HMGB1. The HMGB pathway is altered after the radiation exposures. MPO levels and neutrophils are also altered after the radiation exposure. These are the references of our previous studies. Also, there is host uh, a whole lot of literature is available which shows that in, uh, immunomodulation occurs after radiation exposure. Immunomodulation is the cardinal symptom of net formation in the autoimmune diseases. 
Nets are also the therapeutic targets since immunomodulation is happening after, in day, is after irradiation. With that in mind, it was proposed to look for markers of nets in irradiated animals. The objective of this study was to investigate the formation of nets after radiation exposure and whether nets are amenable to modification by radioprotective drugs. The present study was focused on understanding whether nets uh, are formed after radiation exposure and whether they can be the target of therapeutic drugs. This will be the, my contents for the today's presentation. So as this is the new topic, first of all, I will quickly give a brief introduction. Neutrophils are the first cells of immune system to migrate to a site of inflammation where they play an important role in pathogen elimination and cytokine production. Do, uh, for this, they use a different uh, uh, mechanisms. First is phagocytosis. In phagocytosis, the internalized microorganism is translocated to phagosomes where the antimicrobial uh, factors derived from granules and reactive oxygen species create uh, the environment to kill the pathogen. In second uh, mechanism of degranulation is somewhat similar to phagocytosis just in that the uh, pathogen is uh, uh, instead of being uh, phagocytosed it is killed extracellularly by the same antimicrobial factors which are the part of uh, which are released outside the cell. The third mechanism is neutrophil extracellular traps are released by neutrophils to kill the pathogens. Neutrophil extracellular traps are the meshwork of chromatin fibers that are decorated with antimicrobial enzymes such as neutrophil elastase, cathepsin G, and myeloperoxidase. The next scaffold consists of chromatin fibers with a diameter of 15 to 17 nanometer. DNA and histone represents the major constituents. This uh, uh, the term net was first, uh, this phenomena was first described by Brinkman et al. in 2004 and later the uh, Str uh, Str Stringman and Grenner in 2017 uh, gave a term netosis to the process of release of nets from the neutrophil. Whenever, this is the mechanism of net formation, whenever a neutrophil comes in contact with a microorganism or there is an increase in ROS production or cytokines in chemokine production, the elastase present in the neutrophil causes the, uh, uh, cleaves the histones and chromatin decondensation occurs, nuclear envelope becomes porous, which leads to nuclear membrane disintegration. Uh, along with that, there is an activation of PAD4 enzyme, which causes the citrullination of histones. The histones become citrullinated and ultimately leading uh, to release of nets containing histones and uh, histones uh, target microorganisms from the neutrophils. The molecules present in the net or the degradation products of the nets by DNAs1 can act as autoantigen also, excessive formation of degradation failures of net occurs, which ultimately leads to inflammation or alteration of immune markers. Nets may both constitute as a source of autoantigen as well as being a, a propagator of inflammation. Therefore, nets appears to be a therapeutic uh, target as they are implicated uh, in the pathophysiology of variety of inflammatory disorders. The net targeted approaches for the treatment of number of disorders are based on the biomarkers or mediators of netosis. The biomarkers of, or the mediators of nets are uh, PAD4, neutrophil elastase, myeloperoxidase, and HMGV1. Thus, appropriate methods for quantitative net deduction and clinical studies are necessary to establish the potential benefits of nets as therapeutic approach in treatment of autoimmune or inflammatory diseases. The present study is an extension of our previous studies in which we, uh, ha uh, uh, we have used the herbal preparation from Cibacthon leaves and coded as SBL1. And we have observed that one time intraperitoneal administration of SBL1 at 30 mg per kg body weight 30 minutes prior to lethal irradiation rendered more than 90% survival to the irradiated animals 
till day 30 while the uh, irradiated alone animals died died by day 12 and the maximum tolerated dose for sbl1 is 120 mg per kg body weight and the ld50 was 140 mg per kg body weight we had also quantified the bioactive constituents of sbl1 using hptlc and gallic acid ethyl esters and question dihydride were found to be the major bioactive constituents present in the aqueous extract of hippophy that is sbl1 so in this study the objective of this study was to uh, uh, was uh, was to investigate the radioprotective effects of uh, these both bioactive agents and to check whether nets are formed in case of lethal irradiation and if formed can these two bioactive agents uh, counter the formation of nets so the, the inflammatory markers that is tnf hmgv1 tlr2 tlr4 were studied using the elisa methods and it was observed uh, the study was uh, performed in a time dependent manner from 30 minutes to 24 hours. And it was observed that in irradiated animals, the levels of TNR, TNF alpha increased significantly from 30 minutes till eight hours. Thereafter, the levels declined. While in case of uh, uh, gallic acid, uh, while in case of irradiated animals pre-treated with gallic acid ethyl esters, the levels increased significantly from 30 minutes till two hours. Thereafter, the levels were comparable to controls. In case of irradiated animals pre-treated with quercetin, the levels of TNF increased significantly from 30 minutes uh, till two, uh, four hours. Thereafter, the levels were comparable to control. However, in both the gallic acid alone or quercetin alone uh, group, the levels were comparable to control at all the study points. In uh, the levels of HMGV1, the levels of HMGV1 uh, also increased significantly in irradiated animals at all the time points till eight hours. Thereafter, the levels were comparable to the control animals. In case of uh, gallic acid treated irradiated animals, the levels of HMGV1 increased only at 30 minutes and one hour, while the levels were comparable to control at all the study points. In case of quercetin treated irradiated animals, the levels increases significantly from uh, 30 minutes to two hour. Thereafter, the levels were comparable to control animals. Why in case of uh, gallic acid alone and qu quercetin alone, the levels were compar comparable to uh, control animals at all the study points. The levels of TLR2 increased significantly from 30 minutes till eight hour uh, at all the study points Thereafter, the levels uh, starts declining. In case of uh, gallic acid treated irradiated animals, the levels increases significantly only at 30 minutes and one hour, uh, while the levels were comparable to control at all other study points. In case of quercetin treated irradiated animals, the levels of TLR2 increased significantly th from 30 minutes to two hour. Thereafter, the levels were comparable to uh, uh, untreated animals. The levels of TLR4 also increased significantly in irradiated animals from 30 minutes to 8 hours, while the in gallic acid treated irradiated animals, the levels increases only at 1 hour and 2 hour, while the levels were comparable to untreated animals at all other study points. In question treated irradiated animals, the levels uh, also, the levels increases significantly only at two time points, that is at one hour and two hour, while it was comparable to untreated animals at all other study points. As uh, the maximum significant uh, difference was observed at eight hour, so all the uh, prior uh, all uh, further studies were carried out at eight hour only. The markers for uh, net formation like PAD4, citrullinated histone, MPO, elastase were also studied by using ELISA. And it was observed that in case of irradiated animals, the markers increased significantly from 30 minutes till eight hour. While in case of, uh, while the levels were not, uh, did not show any significant changes in gallic acid 
treated irradiated animal or pristine treated irradiated animals uh, they were uh, comparable to control at all the time points and gallic acid or quercetin alone also did not show any significant change the levels of citrullinated histones show uh, in irradiated animals show a significant increase from 30 minutes to 8 hour while the level starts declining after 8 hours uh, in uh, the levels of citrullinated histones also did not show any significant change at all other study groups the ampule levels show a significant increase in irradiated animals at all the study points uh while in uh, gallic acid treated irradiated animals the levels of ampio increased significantly from 30 minutes to 2 hour thereafter the levels were comparable to control and in case of pristine treated irradiated animals the levels of ampio increased significantly from 30 minutes to 4 hours thereafter the levels were comparable to control the elastase levels also shows a significant increase in irradiated animals uh, and the in uh, animals treated with gallic acid prior to irradiation the levels show significant increase from 30 minutes to 4 hours thereafter the levels were comparable to control in case of quercetin treated irradiated animals the levels of elastase show a significant increase from 30 minutes to 2 hour thereafter the levels were comparable to control in this uh, study also we observed the maximum significant difference at 8 hours so we carried out for the studies at 8 hour only we also studied the uh, changes in the key molecular identities entities identities at leader at leader dose and in case of tnf uh, irradiated animal shows a 5.6 fold upregulation was observed in case of tnf while all other study groups significant change uh, was not observed hmgv1 levels also show a significant increase of 6.5 uh, fold uh, while in other groups the levels were not significant tlr2 uh, uh, show uh, was upregulated 4.5 fold while in other study groups the levels were not uh, were upregulated were upregulated in case of uh, gallic acid treated irradiated and quercetin treated irradiated but the upregulation was not significant in tlr4 a 3.4 fold uh, upregulation was observed in the expression of uh, tlr4 gene okay ma'am i'm as uh, in net inducing genes uh, the gene expression of net inducing gene also show a significant uh, in uh, up, up regulation in irradiated animals we further uh, confirmed uh, our uh, uh, results by we also studied the protein expression of inflammation and net formation causing uh, proteins and uh, uh, at all the study points significant increase was uh, observed in irradiated animals while the animals treated with the bioactive agent show Uh, did not show any significant uh, change proving the radio protective activity of both the bioactive agents the protein ex of uh, net inducing uh, proteins also uh, show a significant uh, change in irradiated animals while uh, in case of uh, by uh, drug treated uh, irradiated animals the level the uh, protein uh, expression did not show a significant difference so this is the proposed pathway of our that uh, in case of irradiation neutrophils get activated and ros are pro, uh, uh, there is a production of ros which uh, uh, ros and further h2o2 h2o2 can lead to elastase release pad4 activation chromatin decondensation and loss of uh, membrane integration leading to histone citrullation which ultimately re, uh, causes release of chromatin associated with proteinase and citrullinated histones uh, alternatively uh, ionizing radiation exposure can cause inflammation due to which hmgv pathway can gets activated and which further via tlr2 and tlr4 activation causes the release of chromatin and associated with proteinase and citrullinated histones so uh, we propose that our uh, bioactive agents work at 
this uh, altering this pathway by uh, capt uh, uh, by stopping the release of uh, this ROS production due to which the nets release uh, is uh, nets are not released. So. Ours is the first study to demonstrate the formation of extracellular traps after whole body gamma irradiation. Gallic acid ethyl ester and quercetin dihydrate could be a promising candidate for developing radioprotective agent via countering radiation induced inflammation and nets. In view of increasing use of ionizing radiation, this study generated important new knowledge which has pro uh, prophylactic as well as therapeutic implications in clinical studies. The study has been awarded a CRB ACS Online Research Poster Competition 2021 Award and, it, and we have been awarded the first rank in life science category. I would like to uh, acknowledge Dr. Madhubala Madam for her constant support uh, and guidance and suggestions in carrying out this study. I also acknowledge the sir for funding this study. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manu. The session is open for discussion. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Manu, for your very nice presentation. And now I invite the next speaker, Dr. Priyanka Sharma. She is Assistant Professor in Department of Zoology at Government uh, College, Jalor. But presently, she is Deputy at Government Shaka Sundar PG College, Sakarli, near Jaipur. She has had a postdoctoral research experience of three years after doing her PhD. The title of her PhD thesis was Prevention of Radiation Induced Testicular Dysfunction by Endospora Monopolia, which is an Indian medicinal plant extract. She has been associated with the MHRD projects, one on virtual labs and the second on institutional innovation. She has published about 22 papers uh, in uh, journals of national and international review and has participated and attended more than 28 conferences. She has, uh, to her credit, two awards, awards for best oral presentation uh, at the national conference and another for, another again for the best poster presentation. She is a member of uh, various international and national professional organizations and now I invite her for her presentation and her talk is on effect of radiation on testicular tissue and its prevention by Amrita, that is Tidospora polypolia, a comparative study. Uh, Dr. Priyanka Sharma, please. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for uh, this kind introduction. A very good afternoon, one and all present over here to attend this international conference on radiation biology. At the outset, I, Dr. Priyanka Sharma, would like to take an, an opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to the patron of this conference, respected sir, Dr. G.P. Singh, President ISRB, respected madam, Dr. Madhubala, convener ISRB, respected sir, Dr. R.K. Purohit, and all the members of organizing committee for providing this platform where we can share our research work. In these few couple of minutes, I'll walk you through the various damaging effects of ionizing radiations along with various mechanisms, particularly on the testicular tissue and modulation or protective protections offered by the Tynospora cordifolia against these damaging effects. Uh, Tynospora cordifolia, that is commonly known as neem deloy and uh, the protection uh, specifically in terms of histopathological as well as antioxidative parameters. Now I'm going to share my screen. Please ma'am confirm whether my screen is visible. Ma'am, my screen is visible. Yes, madam, your screen is visible. Yes, very much. Okay, ma'am. Yes, very much. Your audible as well as visible. Okay, ma'am. So, as we all know that, uh, uh, yes, ma'am. As we all know that uh, reproduction is very essential for any species to sustain its population, and therefore any hazard to reproductive uh, uh, system. Hazard may be produced by the radiation or any other environmental toxicants. And reproductive system as far as concerned with the male and female, both are equally important. So uh, this concern uh, to the reproductive health nowadays uh, become prominent issue in the recent decades. And uh, male infertility uh, comprises an international phenomenon. 
male infertility that is related basically with the testicular tissue and this testicular tissue is highly vulnerable to the radiation induced oxidative stress uh, oxidative stress is the major factor through which the ionizing radiation exerts its deleterious effects uh, that is the major factor in the etiology of uh, the male infertility and there are basically two reasons are responsible for this uh, damaging effect of oxidative stress to this particular tissue that is testis Uh, first is that uh, this particular tissue has a fast dividing cells or uh, fast cellular renewal systems and the uh, second one that is equally important is a uh, uh, poor antioxidant uh, system uh, actually jo anti antioxidant system that is present in another tissue uh, that is not much activated or that is not present in good amount in this particular tissue and this oxidative stress Uh, basically exerts its effect uh, through different uh, effects like somatic effects there are multiple somatic effects are there biochemical effects are there and genetic effects are there and these three effects synergistically produce different testicular dysfunctions in different forms this particular slide is basically showing the mechanism of uh, anazing radiation anazing radiation exerts its effects basically through the production of uh, free radicals and these free radicals generate pretty rigorous condition to the uh, essential biomolecules like protein carbohydrate nucleic acid and even to water and uh, these chemical lesions uh, uh, exerts different uh, cytogenic cytosidal effects and these cytosidal effects uh, ultimately leads to cell death uh, for the uh, recent decades several decades uh, it has been reported that uh, 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 sorry i just want to uh, go for my previous slide again uh, and uh, due to increasing radiation exposure it is very much urgent need to identify any radio protector that could be a synthetic one or natural uh, that to provide its multiple effects uh, it's a synergistic or its protective effect through multiple mechanisms like prevention of radical production free radical squenching and it could be enhanced cell repair system or another or many more and in recent decades it has been reported that uh, the natural radio protectors uh, are more potent are more uh, are more uh, more valuable than the synthetic counterparts due to its better cultural acceptability better compatibility with human body better efficacy with lesser side effects these are uh, there are various natural radio protectors has been reported and they are providing various multiple mechanisms through uh, some of uh, some of them are present here that like uh, increased glutathione level reduced lipid peroxidation level induced cell cycle arrest and uh, reduce the protein oxidation and many more and keeping these views uh, the present study for this present study we select the tinospora cordifolia that belongs to family mananspermaceae its common name is guduchi or neem giloy and uh, the present study was carried out by using its root uh, and uh, that found in the subtropical region of india and china tinospora cordifolia it's uh, uh, not new in this covid period uh, we all are very much familiar about this tinospora cordifolia even uh, neem giloy even the rural belt areas people are very uh, now understand that what is the beneficial role what is the medicinal properties of this tinospora cordifolia or neem giloy uh, various co chemical constants has been identified uh, through this tinospora cordifolia uh, these are alkaloid glycosides aliphatic compounds steroids and uh, dipteranoids and uh, due to the synergistic effect of all these bioactive constants various uh, properties has been claimed from the tinospora cordifolia the, these are the therapeutic properties as well as medicinal properties for the present study males with selbinomice were selected from an inbreed colony and uh, get got ho whole body irradiated with 5 gray and 7.5 gray since uh, uh, this presentation is focused on the comparative study that is related with the 5 gray and 7.5 gray that's why i have included these two ways two doses this is a process through which i have, i have prepared the root hydroalkylic root extract of the tinospora cordifolia uh, uh, from the inbreed colony animals were selected and randomly divided into four groups group 1 that is treated with the double distilled water that uh, given by the oral gavage and uh, these uh, group are also known as fecal treated group group 2 that re uh, <clears throat> that received Uh, optimum dose of tinospora cordifolia that is 75 mg per kg per kg body weight per day group 
three, that is uh, uh, irradiated control animal. In this animal, receive double distilled water and uh, uh, consecutively for five days. And after the last dose of, dose of administration, animal got irradi irradiated with two doses, five gray and seven point five gray. Group four, that is the TC treated irradiated experimental animal. In this group, animal treated with optimum dose of TC, as in group two, and get and got irradiated with 5 gray and 7.5 gray as in group 3 as in group 3 yes uh, animal were observed throughout the experimental period that is from the 12 hours to 30 days for the various changes that is related with its behavior or uh, body weight tissue weight and weight index we have conducted various experiment like we have conducted various qualitative changes quantitative changes biochemical uh, parameters and antioxidative parameters but this in particular but in this particular presentation i am focusing only on the histopathological alterations as well as antioxidative parameters animals were autopsied uh, throughout the experimental period at various autopsy necropsy intervals like 12 hours 24 hours day 3 day 7 day 15th and day 30th <clears throat> As far as concerned with the results, first I would I would like to mention that uh, the uh, dose of uh, uh, the effect of radiation was directly related with the dose of radiation. Um, as much energy was released by the radiation, the effect of the uh, damage was increased considerably. So um, the damaging effect was uh, more higher in the higher dose, like 7.5 gray effects was more severe than the 5 gray. And uh, as far as concerned with the mortality, uh, in 7.5 gray, uh, the animal could not survive beyond the 17th day of experimentation. That means 100% mortality was observed on the day 17th. So in this particular slide, I'm just going to focus on the um, alterations related with the peripheral tubular diameter. We can see here clearly that uh, the TC alone treated animals did not show any significant alteration as compared to the normal one. Uh, but as far as concerned with the irradiated control animals, irradiated control animals showed a uh, significant uh, decrease till day 15 in both 7.5 gray and as well as in 5 gray animals. And uh, <clears throat> um, thereafter, a significant uh, increase was observed towards the uh, end of the experimentation. Uh, in experimental animals, when animals get to, uh, irradiated, in addition to the TC supplementation, a better picture was found and peripheral tubular diameter was considerably higher as compared to the, uh, their respective control animals, but the normal level could not be achieved. In central tubular diameter, the, process, uh, the alteration or modulation uh, mode was quite similar as to the peripheral tubular diameter. The uh, damage was extinct extended up to the day seven, uh, day seven, uh, sorry, day 15th. And afterwards, a significant recover, uh, increase was observed till the end of experimentation. Uh, mode of alteration, yes, ma'am. Mode of alteration was, uh, was, was quite similar in experimental animals, but the normal level could not be recovered even till the end of experimentation in both the uh, five group as well as in 7.5 grade. This slide is showing the histopathological observation that is uh, of the normal or TC alone treated animals. We are seeing that uh, there is no uh, significant difference between these two slides. Now, if we are seeing this, uh, this particular slide uh, that's showing the irrigate control animals with 5.0 gray, uh, 5 gray, there are various histopathological alterations were present in terms of intertubular edema, cytoplasmic peculation, pycnotic nuclei, necrotic cells were present, exfoliated cells were also present. The damage was, uh, this extent of damage was uh, begin uh, from the very beginning of experimentation, like from 24 hours, and the extent of damage was uh, highest or the uh, uh, intensity was uh, highest at the day seven, where we can clearly see that uh, the uh, germinal cells was quite low, uh, actually uh, uh, completely altered spermatogenesis will be there, were there. And uh, by the end of experimentation, damage, uh, extent of damage was quite lower, but the normal picture could not be recovered. This is a slide that is showing the experimental animals. 
uh, uh, testicular uh, tissues of experimental animal that uh, and we found that uh, the uh, comparatively recovering process was was there and uh, the density of the germ cells different germ cells and other uh, histopathological alterations was quite uh, um, high, uh, quite quite in better picture as compared to the radiated control but not as like of the normal level this slide is showing the uh, irradiated control animal that uh, with the 7.5 gray, where we found that uh, the <clears throat> completely distorted or disfiguration of the testicular architecture structure were there and uh, completely distorted spermatogenesis were there. On day seven, we found that uh, the extreme or uh, much intensified damage were present. And uh, on day 15th, we found that uh, uh, the damage was there, but uh, so to a lesser extent. In experimental animal, where uh, animals treated with the uh, TC pre-treated pre-treatment, uh, the picture was quite uh, better, but it was not as that of the uh, normal level. Uh, by the day 30th, the tubules were quite uh, circular with densely populated germ cells. But uh, again, the various histopathological alterations were still there. As far as concerned with the uh, antioxidative parameters, animals when treated with the radiation, uh, the glutathione level was found to be quite lower to combat the different uh, and, uh, adverse effect of ionizing radiation. We found that <coughs> a maximum decrease was observed on day 7th for 5 gray as well as for 7.5 gray. And uh, thereafter, a significant increase was observed till the end of experimentation. <coughs> In experimental animal, the GSH level was quite higher as compared to the respective control at all the autopsy intervals, but um, the normal level uh, could not be regained even till the end of experimentation. Lipid peroxidation level was, uh, uh, in contrast, uh, goes higher in, uh, in uh, after the uh, irradiation. We can, as we can see here, that uh, on day seven. Uh, the LPA level was quite higher as compared to the normal or uh, as compared to the TC alone treated animals. But in experimental animals, LPA level uh, was quite lower, but uh, the normal level could not be <coughs> uh, could not be restored. In uh, 7.5 grade, the extent of damage was quite higher. So the LPA level was, uh, was much higher than the uh, 5.0 grade. If we are compare, uh, if we are uh, see the catalyst level in these two uh, groups, five gray and seven point five gray, we can see here that uh, in seven point five gray, the uh, catalyst level was found to be significantly uh, decreased up, up to day seven. Afterwards, it's found to be significantly in it, it uh, obtained the trend of significant increase till the end of experimentation as well. But uh, in seven point five gray, catalyst level was uh, continuously decreased up to the end of experimentation that is on the 15th day because the animal was could not be uh, could not uh, alive till the end of, end of experimentation and uh, even in the experimental animals um, the catalyst level was significantly restored but the normal picture was not uh, uh, found <clears throat> uh, as far as uh, concerned with the protection offered by the tc through these results we can conclude that uh, there, there could be multiple mechanisms related with its protection. It could be free radical squanging. It could be suppress the free radical formation, decreased lipid peroxidation, immunomodulation could be there, cell proliferation induced, calcium channeling blocking, that could be metal, uh, metal chelating properties uh, is there. So uh, the exact mechanism through which the RTC rendered its radio protection is not fully understood, but these are some mechanism that could be uh, possible. So by the end, we can conclude that uh, radiopathology observed in the current investigation revealed the radiation-induced lesion predominantly dependent upon the total dose of radiation. Higher the dose, higher the energy deposited in the tissue and greater is the damage caused by the radiation. And uh, TC uh, significantly protect uh, or significantly altered all such or uh, alter, uh, all such modulation that uh, has been carried out by the radiation uh, as far as concerned with its uh, body weight, its general sickness, its uh, different uh, tubular diameter. We can say that histopathological alteration were also seen by radiation and the use of herbal preparation as prophylactic agent during the planned and unplanned radiation exposure can be recommended. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you all organizing committee. 
for considering this presentation. Thank you. Dr. Priyanka, for a very nice presentation. And the uh, session is open for discussion. Any questions? Okay, for discussion. Any questions? Okay, no discussion, Dr. Yes. Priyanka. So now yes. we have the last speaker. Can I ask some question, please? I'm Dr. Vijay Kalia. Sure. 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 professor from Nimhans. Sure, sure. <clears throat> uh, Ms. Priyanka, I just want to know one thing. It is just a curiosity. Yes, sir. The doses chosen of radiation and uh, giloy, what was the rationale when you chose 5 gray, 7.5 gray and all that? What was the basis or rationale for choosing those doses and the giloy concentration? Sir, if I uh, talk about the Giloy yeah, Just, just, I mean, you chose arbitrarily or whichever yes. way. Uh, can I know where did you do this work? With whom you started? I'm familiar with the older generation, of course, whether it sir, is Goel or earlier generation or Purohit or anybody. Sir, I'm the research scholar of respected uh, Sir uh, Dr. P. K. Goel, sir. And okay. uh, very good. Uh, yeah. I have done two uh, uh, research projects with, with him, sir. <clears throat> and this is uh, fortunate. Yeah, I, I have, I have I learned a lot. Of his thesis, students' thesis, and one, one viva, but I just want to know how the doses were chosen. So, as far as concerned with the radiation doses, uh, I have worked with the, the ICMR research project, and the, the doses are already present there, sir. 5 gray, 7.5 gray, and 2.5 gray also, also, was also there, sir. So, but this is a comparative study between the 5 gray and 7.5 gray. But as far as concerned with the TC doses, Tinospora doses, we have conducted optimum dose uh, concentration uh, okay, okay. experiments, sir. Yeah, we have fine, uh, fine, fine, okay. fine. That satisfies me. Let's not waste everybody's time. And I just wanted to know this. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can make a comment, Neem Giloy, I have been familiar from the 50s when I was a child. My father was a medical practitioner in Punjab, and he used to use Giloy extract for medicinal purposes. Yes, and so all my life I have known about Giloy. Thank, thank you, sir. Much. I'll ask other questions once the time comes. Okay, thank you, From sir. other speakers. Thank you, thank you. Convey my regards to Goel. Uh, may I ask uh, um, one thing? Uh, uh, the toxicity study for uh, Giloy, uh, was it done on the, uh, on the animal? Yes, sir. Uh, we have like selected. It is with uh, uh, Professor Kalia's line only. The, when you have decided a certain concentration, uh, the toxicity study was done. Yes, sir. Actually, we have uh, taken uh, six doses uh, of the Tinospora cordifolia and extended up to the seven, uh, seven, 7,500 um, uh, uh, milli, microgram per kg per kg body weight. And uh, we found, uh, we have conducted various antioxidative parameters, and on the uh, and uh, uh, by obtain, uh, obtaining that results, we uh, finally select this uh, particular dose. Sir. And, uh, so toxicity was not there. Toxicity was not was not reported, sir. Up to uh, seventy five hundred um, uh, microgram, we we didn't find any toxicity. Yes, Dr. Pramod. Dr. very nice lecture. Uh, you did MSc from our department. I'm very happy to see you here. They have to get PhD from under the Dr. Pramod, well, sir. Did you find yes, that? Did you find LD5030? Yes, case? yes, sir. Sir, uh -huh. we have done LD5030, yes, sir. Uh -huh. And DRF experiment was there. Yes, you did it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we have done, sir. Okay. This is this was uh, this was done in preliminary study, sir. Yeah. I have just, I have published my research paper also uh, on pre preliminary study, sir, in in reputed international journal. We have no. done, sir, all 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 preliminary work, sir. It was both DRF and included. Yes, sir. You Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Priyanka, and to I'm overwhelmed to listen to you and see you as well. And you have really done well with your uh, deliberation.
and uh, once again, a very huge thanks for satisfying the renowned uh, workers on the field of radiation. So that is very good. And I'm proud that you've been a student of our department. Thank you, Priyanka, once again. And uh, moving further, the last speaker for today is Nandini K. She is from Sri Ramchandra Institute of Higher Education and Research. She is presently junior research fellow and is working on establishment and capacity building for rapid radiation triage and dose estimation using gene expression biomarker. She has also worked on project association between DNA repair gene XPD and XPG polymorphisms and micronucleus frequency and co artery disease. Uh, she has done her BSc in microbiology and uh, she's got skilled in amniotic fluid and perifluid blood handling, culture, karyotype analysis, and fish techniques, and also in DNA isolation. And she's got knowledge on maintaining cell lines and performing culture procedures using whole blood, so on and so forth. Uh, so now I invite uh, junior research fellow, Dr. Uh, Nandini K and uh, wishing you that she's pursuing her first year of PhD. She gets her PhD very soon and she's mm -hmm. going to speak on MPXR gene expression, a potential biomarker for rapid radiation triage. Nandini, if you're on the line, please join us. <laughs> Yes, Hello. Uh, good evening, ma'am. I'm audible now. Yes, you're audible. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Nandini from the Department of Human Genetics, Sri Ramchandra Institute of Higher Education and Research, Chennai. So title for my presentation today is FDXR Gene Expression, a Potential Biomarker for Rapid Radiation Triage. So introduction. Introduction, radiation is nothing but the emission and propagation of energy in the form of waves, rays, or particles. And this has a wide range of applications, starting from medicine research to industrial uses, which again has a very wide range like carbon dating, steri uh, sterilization, labeling, and most importantly, electricity. So thus, the usage of nuclear plants has never backed down. And, uh, uh, and they say currently there are about 437 active nuclear power plant, nuclear plants around the globe and India owns 22 of them. So with all this said, we are all well aware of the accidents that have been happening or are still happening around the globe uh, due to various reasons like decay heat, uh, equipment failure or human errors. Uh, and uh, we, we, there are several unforgettable incidents or accidents like Chernobyl, Fukushima, which reminds us about hundreds of casualties that take place when such incidents happen. So that reminds us the need for biodosimetry, uh, which is nothing but the, uh, you know, the uh, exposed individual may, be not, when, may not be wearing a physical uh, dosimetry during such conditions because everybody will be of a different population. So biodosimetry is nothing but the use of biomarkers to verify exposed radiation and to uh, estimate the absorbed dose. Biomarker, again, is nothing but the indicator of the uh, biological process that has taken place. And it is also uh, able to distinguish between the uh, bio, the biological damage from other reagents. So gene expression, uh, uh, there are the different types of uh, uh, there are different types of biodosimetries available. So, uh, example, DCA, MN, and uh, SCE, etc. So, then uh, DCA is considered as the gold standard. Then, why is there a need for another dosimetry? A stitch in time can save nine. Yes. So, gene expression is a biomarker that has started gaining momentum due to its advantages that lacks in the DCA. In contrast to DCA, it does not require a culture or a cell division time. In other words, it is less time consuming. It also does not require hours of labors to complete analysis. Multiple samples can be run simultaneously and processed and analyzed. So, uh, moving on to the pattern. Uh, 
keeping all of this in mind evolution of radiation biology in recent years with many attempts to describe cellular and tissue responses in terms of molecular interactions and genetics has triggered an attempt to identify an appropriate biomarker and a corresponding assay this is based on the knowledge that ir induces complex changes in the level of rna transcripts and proteins exposure of cells to ir activates multiple signal transduction pathways which results in complex alterations in the gene expression these markers however respond differently depending on the radiation quality dose dose rate and most importantly time so keeping all of this in mind we have, we uh, we proposed an objective to standardize and establish the dose response curves for gene expression in the peripheral blood exposed to x, x gamma and alpha rays to validate the gene expression assay using established dicentric chromosomal assay moving on to the methodology uh, so as of now uh, i have completed this for three healthy volunteers uh, age group uh, above 18 so my exclusion criteria consisted of those with a history of dna repair repair syndrome those that have undergone uh, imaging uh, within 3 months of the sample collection uh, and the methodology is as like uh, the peripheral blood will be collected and they'll be oligoported into uh, cryo vials and uh, exposed to irradiation x ray and v6 uh, linac uh, the sham control 0.25 gray 0.5 1 1.5 2.5 and 4 gray The samples are incubated at 37 degrees C and 5% uh, CO2 condition until it is being processed. So DCA uh, is processed uh, with by giving two hours of uh, repair time, and after that it is cultured and 48 hours uh, harvest is done. And the gene expression assay is uh, uh, the RNA is isolated through trisol method, which is uh, as per the kit insert. and the nanodrop quantification is done and the cdna conversion is by using applied biosystems kit method uh, again real time pcr is by using tacman assay uh, which is also uh, coming with a kit method so my calculation will be due to uh, use of relative fold change which is uh, delta power minus delta 2 into delta delta t uh, ct uh, my housekeeping gene here uh, is 18s rrna so moving on to the results this is a representative image of the uh, amplification of the uh, cycles uh, moving on to the results with regard to gene expression so here you can see that the 6 gray 6 uh, hours uh, post incubation the uh, there is a for gradual uh, gradual increase up to 2 gray and after 2 gray the, it is almost a double two fold increase uh, from 2.5 to 4 gray Uh, if you look at the 24 hours post uh, irradiation uh, incubation you can see that there is a gradual increase even up to 4 gray so here uh, this is the point and uh, these are the constituting values on the graph uh, so coming to the dca uh, of for uh, for the same patient Uh, so these are the representative images from the metaphases that i have scored this is a normal metaphase and in this metaphase i was able to identify three dicentric and three acentric fragments accompanying the same uh, over here there is one uh, dicentric and one acentric fragment there are two rings over here and this is a tricentric uh, metaphase with two acentric fragments uh this is the dose response curve for dca in blood sample irradiated with the x ray so this is the dose re dose response curve uh, using the software dose estimate version 4.0 uh, this is the table uh, with the calculation cells counted number of dicentrics and the dc frequency and the uh, standard error so uh, dc also showed a uh, dose in number of uh, abbreviation increases along with the dose increase coming to the discussion the blood lymphocytes x irradiated and incubated at 6 and 24 hours showed a linear increase in the ftxr gene expression uh, fold change so the similar dose dependent increase was also seen in dca which is observed which was uh, exposed to x ray and the there was a positive correlation observed between the gene expression and the dca and the value of r square was found to be 0.96 and the constant dose rate exposure and incubating the samples for about 6 to 8 hours post irradiation for x ray gives about two fold change dose greater than uh, when the doses cross the 2 gray uh, after 2 gray like you saw in my results for 2.5 gray to 4 gray there was a double fold change 
So this is in par with Avent et al. 2021. Uh, Aubrey and G et al. in 2018 observed that the uh, FTXR showed a remarkable sensitivity to IR and the expression level of the same showed a linear increase in the expression levels up to 24 hours. So here uh, in my results also, that was in par with it. Mm -hmm. So conclusion, FDXR has been observed to be a potential biomarker during a triage and as analyzed in healthy volunteers, it also needs to be further validated using peripheral blood samples of patients undergoing radiation therapy or radiation imaging, uh, imaging as they will be exposed to known doses of radiation. Uh, the other uh, the work to be extended is I have to again run G panel of gene like uh, CDKN1A, DDB2, PCNA, those that are involved in DNA damage response. And the irradiation also has to be done for gamma rays and alpha rays. And the suitability of the established and validated assay, as mentioned earlier, has to be run and tested using radiation imaging patient and the radiation therapy patients. Uh, uh, Acknowledgements, I would like to thank AERB Mumbai for their financial support and Department of Human Genetics, Srihar, for their infrastructural support. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nandini. Thank you. Uh, it is open for questions from the audience here and those listening online. Any questions, please? Nandini, it's a nice presentation. Very good work. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, I think even our uh, the college, the Central Research Lab is collaborating with this work with uh, Ramachandra. Okay. So it's uh, a good presentation. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you for uh, giving opportunity to the organizing secretary and all team. Thank Hello. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Nice to see you. And there is some uh, problem in the net. Okay. So I could not join and uh, sorry for that, but I was very happy. Uh, for your, uh, that within a limitation time, you organized so well, sir. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very also good, conveyed good luck for you. I'm very happy you were introduced in the society when you came to Bikane in the year 2012. Thereafter, you organized two, three international conferences. I have been to Bangalore so many times. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, Nandri, I, I have been to see Ramachandra University. Yes. Uh, Dr. Charles Solomon, he organized an international conference. I attended there. I think uh, you are working under uh, Dr. P. Belkar Chalam, if I'm yes, not wrong. Sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, very nice presentation. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, undoubtedly, the session on radiation and health has been very enlightening especially for the upcoming and budding scientists. I see here a lot of young scientists sitting and definitely this is going to help them. So at the end of this session, I would uh, like to first introduce a repetitor because she's not been introduced. She is Dr. Manisha Agarwal, who is Associate Professor in Zoology, working in the Department of Zoology at Government Hindu College, Bikaneer. She is uh, and has an expertise in radiation biology with a teaching experience of, of over 23 years and a research experience of about 12 years. She has supervised three years scholars, has published a number of papers in general of national and has represented various conferences. Uh, not, a, not only at the national and state level, but at the national level. So now, as a record chair of this session, I would request her to present the proceedings. Dr. Manisha Agarwal, please. Thank you, Madam Dr. Neeraj Madam, and Dr. Sucheta Kumari Madam as the chairperson of this session. 
first of all i thank them for very cooperative and very informative co chairperson uh, chairperson uh, for the report of this session first of all professor arun chogle presented very informative lecture on role of ionizing radiation in healthcare as we see in this in his lecture how with the invention discovery of ion x ray and until uh, till date how precision and accurate targeting is achieved in radio diagnosis radiotherapy nuclear medicine etc all the fields are covered very elaborately and very well delivered thank you sir for your nice delivery second lecture was delivered by uh, asit khanta sir sir your uh, lecture was on physical processes uh, interaction with led interaction with uh, dna like particles and their the effect on particles uh, led led was your uh, you you are delivered your lecture led and its their interaction with particles like dna sir it is very informative lecture later on we have three oral presentation and all one almost on herbal protection Uh, and they are very well delivered so thank you all the participants and presenters for their nice deliberation thank you very much thank you madam thank you so once again thanks to one and all for the session thank you guruji ke yahan pe sare theek to nahi hai on behalf of the organizing committee including my own behalf on behalf of the society including on behalf of the dumur college i extend my sincere thanks to professor suchita kumari and kumari from bangalore she is from ritton city and dr professor meera sivastava for chairing the session first of all i would invite dr vidya swastam ma'am all faculty members of our department they will present a memento dr vidya swastam ma'am for chairing the session yes madam <laughs> I I would like to say X because I still feel I am the member of this department. This is for the whole of my department. Now now I would request Dr. Meera Ma'am to on behalf of our department to present Bukhe uh, present Bukhe and the memento to Professor Arun Chogle. the invited speaker of this program okay chetan ma'am you also come you are the alumni of our department chetan ma'am chetan ma'am she has come from surga uh, thank you welcome ma'am chetan you also come please please be careful thank you रिस्पॉन्स मैं देखता जा रहा हूँ कि जो पंडोरा का बॉक्स होता है ना कि जो से वो हाँ सरप्राइजेस मिलते चल रहे हैं है ना बिकॉज आई अटेंडेड सो मेनी पर्सन ठीक है सुबह एक बार हो जाता है ठीक है उसके बाद जो है 
चलता रहता है बट ही इवन केम आउटसाइड टू फॉर मी क्या आप अंदर रहना है तो थैंक यू टू ऑल द डिपार्टमेंट and uh, one thing which i noticed is that entire department is getting involved here bahut aur main dheere se pura ko ki main acha na ye main aaya ko ki main aaya retired logon ko bhi abhi tak jo hai they are not tired they to hold kar ke rakha hai hai na they are not tired bhi ye itna sobri to ye ek jo family hoti hai na wo family bonding bahut achhi lagi and that is a team work bahut acha aur abhi main baitha tha tabhi keh rahe the maine kaha koi to acche manager ka kaam hota hai aur jo leadership hoti hai wo relax kar sakte hai aur baaki ke upar respond kar sakte hai kyunki unless and till trust you are uh, the team team work nahi ho sakta kaho ki main khud hi kar lu to khud hi kar lu they he is trusted he can they can come they can along with that contribution very very important मैं भी देखते जा रहा था कि मैं किस वक्त बुला कर था मुझे पता नहीं कल्चर प्रोग्राम ये लोग देने जा रहे हैं या और कोई देने जा रहा है लेकिन मुझे तो लगा बॉन्डिंग जो है उसको और स्ट्रांग करनी है वेरी नाइस वेरी गुड थैंक यू डॉक्टर चोले नाउ वी क्लोज दी लास्ट सेशन ऑफ दी कॉन्फ्रेंस नाउ आई एम वेरी सॉरी वी आर एट लीस्ट वन आर डेट I would request the committee member of cultural program to uh, please go ahead. The patron and principal of the college, along with his life partner, he will be reaching soon in the auditorium. So, dear students, please be with us. Again, we will have a cup of tea. Please be seated here. And the cultural committee now. Uh, I hand over mic to uh, Dr. Sonu Shiva to uh, organize the program for the program. पुलिस कर दो बस तो बस ठीक है आप इसे किसी की चाबी यहाँ पे रही है
अब इसका तो काम खत्म हो गया फेसबुक चल रहा है ये आपका लाइव है ना मैं भी दे दूंगा बस ये वाली पिन निकाल अब वो नहीं चलाना कंसर्ट बाहर का थोड़ी कोई है After day of academic deliberations, I hope this cultural evening will relax you and entertain you. The soul of any culture resides in its art and literature. The culture of Rajasthan is infused with folk songs and dance. Rajasthan is known for its rich cultural heritage, folk dances, and songs. Play an important role, which are not only historically pleasing, but they also bring stories in a unique and captivating way. Who would have predicted she or a Pakistani folk dance? The dance was introduced by Team Chai. The next on the line, a folk dance is Kalbelia, a dance which was considered to be intangible heritage by UNESCO. The dance moves are mostly serving by they are like other folk dances. Like Bhavai, Kachigori, Kiran, and Chai. And just to represent the culture we represent, we would like to bring on stage all the colors and the music from the stage. Oh, 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 Any of species of beauty that you can name, we all know our heads. Without them, we are not nature. We don't start any bias activity in our daily lives. This culture will be a special occasion. Lord Arjun, a symbol of prosperity and prosperity, should be worshipped before anyone else. We would like to start our culture day with such an invocation of Lord Arjun. I would like to invite Varsha Sharma and Anuradha Sharma. Hello, hello, hello. 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 Hello, hello,
Thank you, Varsha Sharma and Anurada Sharma for this very study. Rajasthan is a land of culture, art and sand dunes. Rajasthan has a rich history of art and paintings. The folk songs of Rajasthan are so popular that they are performed and sung throughout the world. Kesariya Banal is such a song. It has become an inseparable part of Rajasthan. The song is related to a love story of Dola Maru. The smell of the song can be smelled in the soil of Rajasthan. The song was performed by Allah Jalai Bai in the court of Maharaja Ganga Singh. I would like to invite a student, Yogesh Purohit, to recreate the magic of the song. आप उसको चेक करते हैं तो लिखे करना पड़ेगा आपको Oh, no. 
पंडित सगरी मोरी रजनी दी थी श्याम सुंदर ने न्याय मोरे Thank <laughs> you. 
Pakistan and grandeur of Rajasthan in the air. I now invite Muskan Sondara for one more dance because Rajasthan is a homeland of many dancers. So there's a little change in the in this order. I invite Kusi Sharma for the dance performance. Thank <laughs> you. 
Good evening. Uh, may I may request on the principal sir, Prashpa ma'am, come on the dais, Mr. Togli, Dr. Rakesh sir, we will felicitate the participants of the kids program. Satish Muttasna, you also are requested to come to the dais. Dimti ma'am, I think you are looking after the whole culture program. Please come on the dais. Dina ma'am, Dr. Dina sir, Dr. Dina, please come to the dais. Aruna, Chakrati, please come to the dais. First of all, I would request Dr. Lila to welcome Pushpa Ma'am for presenting a bouquet. Dr. Lila Puru, she is a member of the Ethics Committee. Dr. Nanta Singhi, she was the convener of the Ethics Committee. She is suffering from so on. First of all, Dr. Lila, you bouquet to Pushpa, ma'am. Am I switching? Sorry, 
कहां पे दे रहे हैं वो रिपीट आता रहेगा दिखेगा नहीं ना ये पिक्चर आएगी नहीं फेस तो बच जाएगा वो वर्षा शर्मा बी ए पार्ट फर्स्ट अनुराधा शर्मा एम ए प्रीवियस भूपेश पुरो है Please keep on clapping for the performance of these students. Please encourage our students with claps. Tulsi Sharma. Muskan Sondra. Ved Prakash, Madhu Kanishapal, State B D. Yogesh, Yogesh, Madhu Kanishapal. अरे मजा आ रहा है अरे उस पे लेकिन इस पे नहीं लाइव चल रहा है किसी ने क्या रिकॉर्ड खत्म हो जाएगा जिज्ञासा जिज्ञासा सेन जिज्ञासा सेन तुलसी शर्मा पलक सारस्वत I just hope all our students have received their credentials. पीछे बैंगन वो लगा दो ना पर्दे वाले हाँ ठीक है